Let's read this Christmas story together from Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord Jesus, thank you that 2,000 years ago, after, after telling your people over and over and over again that the Messiah was coming, 2,000 years ago, a weary world was able to rejoice as you fulfilled your promises to your people and you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to us. Father, thank you that he is the light and he is the life of men. Thank you for the way that he has not only saved us from our sin this morning, but he is changing us day by day uh, into more and more uh, of, of his image and his likeness. Lord Jesus, you have not only saved us, you have blessed our lives. You've given meaning and purpose to our lives. We thank you this morning and we worship your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. And every Christian said, Amen. Okay, so we started, and the only good king, isn't that awesome? That's some Lord of the Rings looking stuff right there. If you didn't notice it now, it's all you see. Uh, but it is there. We started this uh, series, and it just doesn't seem right. I, I was supposed, we're supposed to have two more weeks in this series, but it just doesn't seem right on Christmas Eve to talk about the, ba the bad way we use authority. We were going to go through the Old Testament and just look at every character and show you how they all use the authority that God gave them wrongly, and it's why people don't want to be under authority. But authority is a good thing. It comes from God. Ultimate authority is His, and He shares that authority with humanity for our good, for our blessing, for our fruitfulness. Not only to be under good authority is it good for us, but when we use the authority he shares with us in the right way, not only are we blessed, but everybody around us is blessed. So authority is an important part of our lives. But none of us want to be under authority, amen? Now everybody in this room you have probably been given a little, unless you are like the youngest kid still living at home, you've probably had some level of authority in your life. And we like having authority, amen? Right? Uh, so some of you little kids, I mean, the family dog may have more authority than you. Uh, so I know you may not understand what we're talking about, but big brothers, they know a little something about having authority, don't they? Big sisters, they know a little something. That's my just get out of my room. Right? They know. They know. Parents know about authority uh, and, 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 and whatever job you have. I mean, even if you're like the IT guy at your job, everybody in that room knows unless you come fix the computer, they can't get any work done. That's authority. We all like having authority, but none of us like being under authority. And we're always figuring out reasons and justifications why we shouldn't be under authority. Give me Three minutes, I'm, that was going to be all day today, so you're welcome, Merry Christmas. 
I'm going to give you the five-minute version, and then we're going to get into Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the only good king who shows us what using God's authority rightly in life looks like in a way that blesses everyone. That's going to be the, the gist of today. But let me read you one quick section out of this book on authority by Jonathan Lehman. He is a professor, seminarian. He preaches at seminaries all over, or teaches, it rather, at seminaries all over uh, the country. But he's also a lay elder in his church, so he has a really unique perspective. And this is a great book if, you, if you're looking for something to do the last couple of weeks praise God I got to get into the stack of books that I wanted to read that's a big deal listen to this again we're always looking for justifications of why we shouldn't listen or be under authority he says my public school teachers taught me not to trust the church's authority because the church persecuted Galileo They told me not to trust the Bible's authority because science teaches us to leave superstition behind. But then they told me not not to trust science's authority because one generation of scientists will disprove the former. Or the king's authority because there's no such thing as the divine right of kings. Or the democratic majority's authority because majorities can be tyrannical too. Or the authority of the courts because they're always playing politics. Or the authority of philosophers because they're playing language games. Or even language's authority itself because French philosophers observe that people weaponize everyday terms like straight and queer to normalize our preferences and marginalize people who are different. Or the market's authority because capitalism is the conjoined twin of racism. Or police authority because they're racist too. Or the media's authority because it is biased. Or the authority of our XX or XY chromosomes because they don't tell us we must, they don't tell us how we must define our gender. And of course, mom and dad's authority because, well, life is more fun if you can sneak out and party. Haven't you ever seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? When all is said and done, there aren't any authorities left to topple except the authority of me. This is what the writers mean when they describe our day as individualistic. Individualism doesn't mean I like to be alone or I don't have friends. It means nobody can tell me what to do or who to be. No one has authority over me. If we were honest with ourselves, each and every one of us in this room, in any one of those social uh, areas that we all find ourselves in, we've all felt the same way. We've all felt... Uh, the very same about authority. We don't want it, oh, we want to have it, but we don't want it over us. We want to be our own authorities like Adam and Eve in the garden. It doesn't matter what God says. We can be like God's. We can make our own rules. We can make our own commands. We can live our own lives. It is the definition of sin. But I hope to, to show you this morning One good king, the only good king that you should completely and totally submit to and give everything to because in doing so and in being under his authority, your life will be better than you ever thought it could possibly be. Turn to John chapter 1 with me. And we're going to get to John chapter 8. But I want to start in John chapter 1 because every time I read John chapter 8, I think, oh, we got to read John chapter 1 because it goes so well with this. So John chapter 1, we're going to read the first 14 verses. In the beginning, that language takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Because God existed perfectly in harmony with himself. I mean, when you think about God, no beginning, no end. It baffles our mind how he is the alpha and the omega who exists outside of time and space. But in the beginning, he decides to share himself. He decides to create. He decides to uh, bring about this time and space and everything that we know in the universe. All the Hubble telescope pictures. Of, of dozens of years away planets that we can't even travel to. They're so far away. God created all of this that we see, all of this that we experience. John chapter 1 hearkens to creation itself, as we'll see as we move further. 
In the beginning was the word. And that word is logos in the Greek. It's where we get the word logic from. It is the understanding of all things. But he's not just some inanimate object. We know that, that he is a person. And I don't mean person like human being person. He has personhood. He has, he's a motive. He has a will. He has a plan. He, he loves. He can be grieved. So this word, the word was with God and the word was God. It's not just some inanimate thing. He's not just some airwaves. He, he was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. All things are held together by God's word. All things. Colossians tells us if God were to remove himself, the very fabric of time and space would just crumble and evaporate before our very eyes. We would, be, we would come to nothing if Jesus, talk about common grace and why it's important. That's why without even the common grace of God holding all things together, nothing could exist. Nothing could survive. Don't think of God. We, we, so many times we, we take God and we, and we make him a miniature of who he is. We make him small because we like to set him in the palm of our hands. And we like to say, I don't like what you said here. I think you're wrong. We like to judge God, but see God for who he is. Outside of space and a bigger than all of space and time. Always has been, always will be. He is infinitely greater than you can possibly think or imagine. And this God, in him was life. We know this also from Genesis. In verse 27 of chapter 1, when he forms man out of the dust of the ground and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and dust, dirt, meaningless nothing became a living soul. In this God is life. Let me tell you how we're different from God. Can we create? Yep, I bought a Lego set the other day and put it together, and it's awesome. But it's not alive. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could breathe on it, and a little Nintendo set with a TV, just breathe on it, and it becomes a living, working Nintendo set. But no. There's a difference between creator and creation. Even when we get to heaven, man, even when we no longer see through the dark and glass, but we see the beauty and the fullness of who he is, even then we will still be creation and he will still be creator. He will, for the rest of eternity, mesmerize us with his glory, with his majesty, with his awesomeness. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Life and light. That's where we're going in John chapter 8. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness has never won a fight with light. If we were to black out the windows, if we were to shut every uh, electronic, every light bulb, if we were to shut everything down, it was pitch black. And I just had a little pin with, with a light on the end of it. And I pressed the button and that light came on. Each and every one of you would instantly gravitate toward the light. Light has never lost a battle. With the, it doesn't matter how much darkness there is. Just a little bit of light eradicates, pierces through the darkness. This is who Jesus Christ is. He is the light that pierces through in this evil, sick world. Man, I get to him. Our weary world now rejoices because the light has come into the world. And we can see the light. We behold the glory of the light that eradicates the darkness. Aren't you thankful for truth and light today? That we can see, that we can know. His name is Jesus Skip down to verse 9. We've got to hurry. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Ladies, I'm sorry, but all the movies I watch are usually set in the medieval period. Your husband's going to like this illustration, though. Right? In the medieval world, right, there's the caste system. And guess who we are? Each and every one of us in, in that old score. We're the paupers laying on the side of the ground. We're dirty. We're covered in, in, in field and in mess. We have no hope, no life. We can't even find food for ourselves, which is why we're sitting on the side of the road with our hands up trying to get an alm from somebody so we can buy a loaf of bread and survive one more day. That's who we all are spiritually. Sin has stained us. We are forever separated from the royalty that is God. We're not part of his world. There's nothing we can do to earn a place. There's nobody we can trick to get a place at the king's table. We, we are far, far, far away. But then the white horse comes riding by and on the horse sits the king and the king sees us and has compassion on us. His heart fills up for us and he doesn't just reach into his, his uh, plentiful bag of gold coins to give us a, a coin so that we can live a few more days. No, he reaches down and he grabs us and he puts us on the back of his horse and he, he takes us all the way to the castle where his servants clean us up and he puts a new robe uh, on our backs and he puts a, a, a ring on our finger, a signet ring, meaning that we represent him, the family of the king. And then he sits us down at his table and he sups with us. He dines with us. We get to eat with the king. And forevermore, the king makes us what we were not, what we could not be. The king adopts us into his family giving us all the rights, privileges, and pleasures of being a son or a daughter of the only good king. This is what he's done. He's made us the children of God who are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. Go to John chapter 3 and really dig into what that means. We are in this room not by work of the flesh, but by work of the Holy Spirit of God who has brought us into his family. In chapter 14, or verse 14 real quick. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God didn't stay in eternity, God leaves a throne. God steps into time and space and wraps himself in human flesh to show us what it's like to be under God's authority and how to wield God's authority rightly so that everyone around us can be blessed, including ourselves. John chapter 8, start at verse 12. Jesus says, now listen, Jesus has begun, you know, we, we read in Luke chapter 2, he's born, he becomes flesh, the word becomes flesh. But now Jesus is older, he's in his 30s. A Jewish man couldn't speak with authority until the age of 30, so when Jesus turns 30, he begins a public ministry, a public ministry that changed Everything. Look, we're here 2,000 years later. 2024 is around the corner, and we're still here worshiping and talking about Jesus. And all he did was three years of public ministry. Think about that. Bob Dylan had an amazing career. We're still singing his songs. My kid got a harmonica for Christmas, and within three minutes, he's like, he's playing Bob Dylan. It's awesome. Bob Dylan's going to be around for a long time. But do you think in 2,000 years people are going to be talking about Bob Dylan? Look at, the, look at people from the past, the Greek thinkers, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Amazing, thinking, logical men. Their, their work spans 120 years between all three of them. 120 years. Do we still talk about them today? Yeah, we still read their works. If you haven't read The Cave by Plato, or, or right, you, you should. It, it's good stuff. Did they change the world? Yep. 120 years, but Jesus in just three years has done infinitely more than 120 years of Greek thought. Think about that. More books 
have been written about Jesus than any other person who has ever lived. In our Library of Congress, there are thousands of books written on the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You know who comes in number two? William Shakespeare. <laughs> He's got 600 works. Was he an awesome guy? An amazing playwright? Did he have a way with words? Yep. Do people still talk about him? Yep. But not as much as Jesus. Three years. More books written about him. More songs written about him. Sung to him. More buildings erected in his name. More art. Anybody else know more art has been commissioned of Jesus Christ and his life than anyone else? Three years is all it took. And here we find him early in his ministry. And what's he doing? He's arguing with religious leaders. Why? Because religious leaders, they're not using authority that God gives well. The people are suffering under the religious leaders. At one point, Jesus tells them, why don't you just put a millstone around your neck and go jump in a lake? Because that's what you're doing to other people. Not only are you keeping them from the kingdom of God, not only are you not letting them in, but you're making them twice the sons of hell that you are. Jesus said that. Don't get mad at me. So Jesus has the hardest words to speak to the religious leaders than any other people in the Bible. Because they're using authority wrongly to hurt others. To keep their thumb on others. To keep others down. When authority that God gives, when used rightly, should bless and lift up. And bring life and light to men. Jesus spoke with them. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Now underline that. Whoever follows me. Remember back in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, you are the light of the world. How can Jesus say that to us? He can say that to us if we are following him and imitating him and doing our best to live like him. Are we all going to do it uh, wrong? Are we all going to fall in many ways? Of course we are. But it is our role. It is the purpose that God has brought us into his kingdom, made us his children, that we should, when we do fall, pick ourselves up. You know the difference between a righteous man and an unrighteous man? The righteous man will fall seven times, but he gets back up again and he knocks the dust off his shoulders and he continues to follow Jesus. This is how we are the light of the world because we're following the one who is the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We can see truth we can follow truth we can know truth and it can benefit and expand our lives and blessing and fulfillment so the pharisees let's just skip down because they it's a bunch of nonsense what they try to bring to them you can't be a witness uh, to your own self jesus is like i'm not the only witness my father is a witness don't you remember when i was baptized and god spoke from heaven this is my son whom I'm well pleased. I got two. I got more than that. John the Baptist came witnessing before I even got here. Uh, my works speak for themselves. My miracles are a testament and a sign that I am he who I speak of. The Pharisees just can't get it through their thick, dumb, religious, self-righteous skulls. <sighs> I'm having, this is a good sermon, turning out pretty good. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Oh, let's skip to... Let's just skip down to verse 26. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have heard from him. They did not understand that he has been speaking to them about the Father, that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, and here's kind of our verse. I want you to get this in your, in your heart because we've got a job to do. And if we do it poorly, people are going to suffer. But if we do it like Jesus, people are going to be blessed. There's going to be more light. There's going to be more life in this dark world full of death. If we follow Jesus well and use the authority that he shares with us. If we're not only if we're under it, are we going to be blessed? But if we take it and use it rightly the way he wants us to, lots of people are going to be blessed. So how does Jesus show us, wrapped in human flesh, how, how authority should be used? It's right here in verse 28. And it's not just here, it's throughout the Gospels. But let's read this verse. 
So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. He's talking about His crucifixion. Jesus knows what's going to happen. He came to give His life for the ransom of many. When I am lifted up, then you'll know that I am He and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. How does Jesus show us how to use God who is in all authority and shares that? How do we wield it? How do we use it? The same way Jesus does. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus says over and over and over again, I only go where the Father shows me. I only say what the Father tells me to say. I only do what the Father tells me to do. Jesus Christ in human form shows us what it looks like to use the authority of God rightly by honoring and obeying everything he says. Not our will be done, but the will of the Father be done. Skip over to, uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 20 really quick. We're going to end here. We have plenty of time for communion together for Christmas Eve. To go home and be with our families and with our friends. Why, Why can't we get this? I mean, if I went around the room and said, do you believe this is God's word and everything in it is true? Everybody would say yes. But so many times we... We hide certain parts. We sweep certain parts under rugs because we don't want to be under this authority. But yet it's this authority that brings light and life. We need this. This story is hilarious to me. Let's read a couple verses. Now Jesus is with his 12 and one of the moms shows up. It's the mom of the sons of Zebedee. They're called the sons of thunder in other places in Scripture. When people uh, don't believe in Jesus' message, they're like, hey, you want us to call down fire from heaven? We'll just go ahead and consume this whole city. I mean, that, that's James and John. And their mother is now there. And even though these guys are train wrecks, a mother's love, right? Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. That's a big ask. Basically what she's saying is, Lord Jesus, when you're king, we know you're here and we know you're bringing your kingdom. And when your kingdom comes and you're on your throne, can my boys sit at your left hand and at your right hand? Can they be your, your, your right hand, left hand people? Can they be the ones who are whispering in your left ear and in your right ear? Can they sit in these seats of honor and these seats of authority as your conciliaries? Jesus, when your kingdom comes, can they be your right hand and your left hand? That's a big, bold ask. And by the way, when the other disciples find out, they're livid. Why? Because they want those seats. This is the human problem. It's that nature of sin that we've inherited from our first parents. We don't want what's good for everybody. We want what's good for us. We want the places of honor. Since I got saved, I've been part of two different ministry groups. I've been part of a denomination. Let me tell you about denominations. Everybody looks real nice. Everybody's got, I mean, they wear expensive suits. They smell like they just walked out of a perfume shop, right? They're all clean, trimmed, and nicely decorated. But they are some of the I know from in the secular world, most of you live in the secular world, and you know it's dog-eat-dog out there. You know that the guy uh, who gets the corner office is not the guy who deserves it. It's the guy who is a hunting buddy of the brother-in-law of the CEO. That's the guy who gets the office, right? I wish I could tell you it was better in ministry. It's not. (laughs) People are people, and they will kick, stab, slander, gossip, talk about, step on, step over to get the bigger church or the better office or the better job title. 
There is a pecking order in all society of people trying to get to some place that they think they deserve or some place that they think they want and they will kill whoever they have to kill to get there. And then I was like, forget this. This is politics. This is crazy. I don't want to be part of this. So I joined a network. Let me tell you a little something about networks. I thought I was really going to like network. Because when I walked in, everybody was wearing flannel. Everybody had beards. And I was just like, you know what? I, I, I think this can be my tribe. But it didn't take very long to notice that the same problems that existed in the suits is the same problem that exists in the flannels. People just knocking people over and stepping all over to get to that position or that place that they think they have to have. This is the problem with this mother who loves her sons. She wants them to have something that, Jesus, I can't even offer that to you. It's for the Father to decide. It's not my will. It's his will that decides. Jesus answered, and I love this, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And how many of you in this room, you thought you wanted that job or you thought you needed that position and then you got that job or you got that position and you realized it's not so great because everybody hates you because you're in that position. Authority comes with a price. Jesus said, you're not able to drink this cup. And he's referring to the cup of Gethsemane. You remember that prayer he prayed where his sweat became blood? He is fixing to stand before humanity Be judged by humanity, even though he's sinless in all his thought, in all his action, in all his deed. He's never even had an improper motivation. Everything he's done, the Father has told him to do, and he has obeyed. And they're fixing to crucify him on the tree. And it's more than just dying on a tree. It is absorbing the full wrath of God for human sin. Jesus knows exactly what he's facing, which is why in the garden he prayed, Please take, Father, please take this cup from me. Jesus did not want the beard ripped out of his face. He didn't want the, the, the 39, la- the 40 lashes minus one where you could see the organs through the, the shreds of his back. He didn't want the hair pulled out of his head or, or the thorns crushed down into his skull. And he certainly didn't want to feel the full absorption of the wrath of his father for the sins that he did not commit. But what is Jesus' prayer? I don't want to do this, but not my will. Yours be done. Man, if as human beings who follow Jesus, we could just get this. If we could be as altruistic as Jesus, as loving and compassionate towards others as Jesus, man, a lot of people would be blessed. A lot of people would be blessed. They said to him, oh, we are able. You think you're able to drink this cup? Oh, of course. Of course we can do it. Isn't it funny how most often we overestimate our ability? Oh, wrath of God. Yeah, no problem. Sure, we can do that. Guys, he said to them, you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And when the other ten heard it, remember, there's 12 of them. When the other ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. How dare you ask for that? I was going to ask for that. We're just turds, aren't we? Merry Christmas. And we've all done it. We've all been there. But Jesus called them to him and said, and ushers, if you'll go ahead and come and begin to pass out the elements while we read this. But don't be distracted. Don't miss this. We've got a good start. But this is, man, this is the church I want us to be. Not about ourselves. You know why John the Baptist, Jesus said, was the greatest? Because John the Baptist saw when Jesus hit the scene, he told his disciples, stop following me. Start following Jesus. I must decrease. He must increase. Man, if we could catch that, 
It's not about us. It's not about our kingdom. It's not about what we think we're to do or not to do. This is his kingdom, his church, his work. And if we will get on board with him, lots and lots and lots of people are going to be blessed. They're going to see the light. They're going to experience the life that Jesus brings. That's worth our lives, amen? Jesus said, you know how the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. How do people use authority? They use it to crush. They use it to step on. They use it to, to pin down. Not, that's how the Gentiles, that's how the secular world uses it. Not for God's people. Their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and you who follow me. Right? 1 John 2, 6 says, those who claim to live in Christ must walk as Jesus walked. Jesus is the only good king. And we have seen his life. We have seen his service. We have seen the king of glory come down and be stripped naked and bare for the sake of others. And this is what he calls us to. This Christian life, this is not some cushy life. When Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me, I've never seen, and I've looked, I've never seen a cross made out of mattress springs. There is no posturepedic cross. The only cross is wood and it's heavy and it puts splinters in your back and it costs you everything, your very own life. But guess what? Guess what you realize when you're giving your life away that you're not losing anything. You're gaining Christ. You're gaining it all. To live is Christ. To die is gain. We are going to stumble many times. But if we can pick ourselves up and we can dust ourselves off and in the grace of Jesus Christ that he bestows and the righteousness that he bestows upon us, we get back up, dust ourselves off and serve like he served. More people are going to come to Jesus. More people are going to know Jesus. More people are going to celebrate the real reason for the season next December 25th. If we can be the men and the women who follow Jesus the way he calls us to follow. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I love you and I thank you. You are the only good king and you are our example. Father, help us to follow you as we should. Give us the strength and the courage to lay down our lives and to pick up your cross that more people will fill heaven it's in Jesus' name, amen.